Thanks so much, Meredith and Kate. It's uh, great to be here, um, and thanks for assembling this amazing uh, lineup here. And thanks also to uh, Ed and Jason for your remarks this morning and for uh, shepherding the White House interest in this area, this very important area. What I want to talk about this morning is what I'll call the great decoupling, picking up very much on what Jason just uh, discussed, some of the ways that technology, especially artificial intelligence, is changing the economy. and. Uh, the, the great decoupling in brief is this idea that on one hand, people like Bill Gates are saying that uh, technological progress has never been faster. As you see that especially in the areas of artificial intelligence. Um, we have more millionaires and, yes, billionaires than ever before in human history. Um, the GDP is at a record high after surviving the, the Great Recession, in part due to the uh, skillful management of uh, Jason and others in, in uh, the administration. Um, but at the same time, uh, median income, the income of the people at the 50th percentile, is lower now than it was 15 or 20 years ago. So at least half the population in the U.S. is not participating in this enormous growth. Uh, labor force participation is down since, it, since 20 years ago. Jason showed some numbers on that in the United States and in other countries as well. And for the first time in history, uh, polls show that a majority of Americans do not think their children will be better off than they were. So that's a real kind of uh, paradox that on one hand we have these wonderful things happening and, and, and progress and, and many of us have been the beneficiaries and the creators of that abundance, yet many people don't seem to be participating in it. And I want to talk a little bit about how that could happen and, and what, it's what Andrew McAfee and I call the great decoupling. Let me start with a brief touch on some of the technological changes we've had. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, a team of students and I at MIT listed some of the things that humans were uniquely good at and machines were not good at. We came up with interacting with the physical world, language, and problem solving. Today, that reads like a list of uh, things that uh, AI has made progress in, uh, tremendous advances in. Uh, as, we, as you know, we now have uh, beginnings of self-driving cars. Uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge, not the recent one that, that Jason talked about, but the earlier one was to make a self-driving car, and those are very much on the horizon. Uh, companies like Toyota and others are putting uh, billions of dollars into that um, within the belief that it's, uh, it's imminent. And having ridden in a number of them, I, I, I'm convinced that uh, that technology is very feasible. We have robots that are working alongside humans. Jason showed charts of millions of robots being deployed. This is Baxter, who works for about the equivalent of $4 an hour, doing tasks that millions of humans uh, currently do in factories around the world. We have machines that are learning how to uh, uh, speak. Uh, today, if you walk down the street here in New York, you may see somebody talking on their phone, and there's a good chance they're actually not talking to another human. They're talking to the machine and expecting the machine to answer back. Uh, Tom Mitchell says we're in the middle of a 10-year period where we went from machines not really being able to understand us to routinely being able to interact with us. That's a pretty fundamental milestone in human history when you think about it. Translating, uh, even writing text, uh, diagnosing diseases. Uh, I read this, uh, this week about uh, DeepMind's project to diagnose eye diseases and earlier than earlier uh, working on kidney diseases and I have no doubt uh, they'll make significant progress in that in part because vision has gotten so much better uh, machines can now see better than humans in, uh, on tests like ImageNet or reading street signs and that's a another real breakthrough so what does all this mean well here's the key chart and you're going to see a lot of data today so this is the one you have to remember for today or at least for this talk, uh, this is the great decoupling, or one way of showing it. And on one hand, you see that productivity has been growing. There's a little leveling off there towards the end. It's not growing quite as fast. Uh, but by and large, we're able to produce more and more output as we conventionally measure it, uh, with less and less labor input, i.e. productivity is going up. And that's uh, a necessary, and I used to think sufficient condition, for raising living standards, but it's no longer viewed by me and most economists as a sufficient condition, because you see the other chart there, uh, the other line there is median income, uh, which has become decoupled. After hundreds of years of being tightly related, median income rising right alongside productivity, in the past couple of decades it's become decoupled, and that means that 50% of the population is not experiencing the rise in living standards. The pie is getting bigger, but a lot of people aren't participating. And that's a function of a fundamental economic fact, the hard truth that um, even though the economic pie is getting bigger, there is simply no economic law 
that says that everybody is going to participate. Some people, even potentially a majority of people, will not automatically participate. And there are three aspects of bias technical change that drive that. Um, one is skill bias technical change uh, that Jason alluded to, that more educated workers often are better able to take advantage of some of these technologies. Meanwhile, they substitute in many cases for middle skill and lower skill jobs. And so you can see that while they rose together, more recently they've really spread out. And those of us with graduate degrees have done reasonably well, but if you don't have a college degree, um, the, your wages have not gone up. And again, this is not just due to technology. There are a number of factors, but it's one of the factors. The second kind of bias technical change is capital. The red line there shows that labor is not getting as big a share of GDP as it used to. And the third one is what I call superstar bias technical change. We've all heard about the 1%. The well, the 1% have their own 1%. This is the 0.01%. And they are also at a record high. And one of the reasons for that, in addition to some institutional changes, is that these technologies make it possible to replicate ideas, insights, talent, or luck um, very quickly to millions or even billions of people. And if you make a dollar on each of those people, you can quickly become a millionaire or a billionaire. And that's something that's much more feasible to, with today's technology, especially some of the artificial intelligence technologies than previously. So let me close by saying that I think we need a new grand challenge, and it's very much in the spirit of what Jason said. Um, while the technology is racing ahead, and I think we, we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of what the potential is for the future, many people are being left behind, and it, I think that's a function not of problems with the technology, but the fact that our skills, our organizations, our institutions are not keeping up. And that means that we can't just continue with business as usual. We need to speed up the changes in our organizations and our skills to keep up with these changes in technology. I don't believe that these problems are driven entirely by technology. It's, I'm not a technological determinist. I believe instead that we shape our destiny, and it's up to us to take advantage of the technologies to uh, create not just prosperity, but shared prosperity. And if you want to read a little bit more about this, I have a number of, of papers and articles and a book with Andy McAfee that go into it a little, in a little bit more depth. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, keep us moving along.